Welcome back to Information Revolution, a podcast about information for people who are working in it, uh, thinking about what's changing and thinking about what needs to change in our working lives. Um, my name is Michael Upton. I'm a director of MetaTaxis New Zealand, uh, based in Wellington, um, and I've been thinking about digital information for as long as I can remember. Sad. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm Judy Verno. I'm also a director of MetaTaxis New Zealand in Wellington, and I'm an information architect, which I have to say I've been for a very long time. It's just that we didn't call ourselves that once upon a time. All right, and I'm Carl Melrose. I work for Castle Point Systems in Canberra. Um, you know, quick disclaimer though: my uh, my views are not the views of my employer. Um, and you know what? I've been around information for a while and I have point, strong points of view, which, you know, Judy and Michael well know. So, Michael, what are we here to talk about today? I'm actually going to ask Judy that one. Whoa. Well, we thought we would talk about um, all kinds of aspects of helping people to find stuff. Uh, what uh, is generally termed findability. People quite often just refer to that as search. But uh, that always really bugs me because there's lots of different ways of finding stuff that isn't just about search. And, uh, yeah, I was thinking this morning, you know, if I had a dollar for every time a client has said, um, oh, we all we need is a decent search engine and that will sort us out, then I could take myself out for actually really quite a nice meal. Mm. Um, you could sit down with them and say, great. Find me the guide about how we write enterprise agreements, please. And, you know, when they searched for enterprise agreement and found the first, you know, had the first 14,000 search results that came up be where enterprise agreement occurred 17 times in a document because, you know, of course, it's going to rank it by relevance and it's got, your search engine's going to look at that and say, well, you know, obviously frequency equals relevance. And so, therefore, you yeah. know, the document that there says is. enterprise agreement yeah. the most. Yeah. Yeah, I think the thing that, bugs me most about it is that organizations tend not to try and find out um, how their people actually want to look for stuff you know what would help them what is the information they're trying to find and what are the kinds of tools and I mean kind of semantic and technical tools that would help them to do that there seems to be quite a resistance to actually asking people these kinds of questions. But when you do ask them, I tend to find people have quite a lot to say on the subject. And uh, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And so putting in a new search in might help hugely, but, uh, you know, it's not the only thing. And if you don't support that search engine with decent, I'm going to say taxonomies, it's just <laughs> Put that word there for a minute. Um, metadata and taxonomies, then yeah, it's probably not going to do what you need it to do. Is my view? Mm -hmm. For sure, for sure. And I guess I should remind all of our listeners out there. So this is part of our talking about the people stuff, and you know, it's a really strong theme yeah. in terms of working with people is understanding what they need in terms of yeah. how they access information. Exactly. Um, yeah. And I, I, think, a... I, I think I think that the diversity of those kind of scenarios of where people are trying to find stuff in order to do their jobs, to deliver a service to someone else, to, you know, um, just meet a certain requirement, you know, that, that's so different to mm. the kinds of finding activities people are doing on the internet. And we have to say that out Very loud. Very true. The whole thing of like, why can't we just chuck in a Google type search exactly. engine? Exactly. And even if you put aside all the technicalities around how Google delivers its results, the kinds of things you try and do via a web search versus, for instance, um, you know, a really obvious example of where search hits a limit is where is all the information about our interaction with a particular person? Like a, a browsing style thing of going to that mm. person and finding the information about them would would be so much more efficient you know it's, it's an easy yeah. way to get the information compared to um, search I mean of course you can search on their name but you still want to get an aggregation you still want to get a container and that's driven through a taxonomy through metadata through whatever so you know it's the kind of thing where um, yeah it, it, it does really frustrate me and in particular technical people seem to miss the value of browsing I suppose absolutely you know, uh, and, it, and, it, and I feel that that's because they haven't done that people interaction stuff. They haven't done that conversation around how is it that you need to find stuff and on what sort of 
you know, almost what are your criteria? And and in, yeah. in my mind, I almost I, I'm I'm trying to think about this in as sort of technology and agnostic a way as possible. Mm. I, I don't care if it's actually it is actually sort of search based software that delivers the outcome. It's more about how does that person interact with the information in order to get what they need. So and it it will depend hugely on whether they're looking for a specific document. You know, they mm. want that mm. report. They want that presentation. Mm. Or they want some documents that will help to answer their question. Or they want everything they can find about this because they need to find everything that's out there about, I don't know, I don't know what the organization is doing around climate change, for example. Um, and you could search on climate change, but there will be loads of documents there, I'll bet, that don't use that term at all because it's just about an aspect of it but it be, could be yeah. very relevant. So in that case, it, it's the you don't know what you don't know kind of thing where you, you really need to be able to browse around a logical structure to be able to find as, as much of that as possible, but also use metadata and taxonomy to, to guide you around the available mm -hmm. topics as well. Yeah. Yep. I mean, this is and why I think ontologies are really starting to pop up everywhere. And it's because, you know, I mean, if you if you look at, there's a couple of underlying issues here, you know, what, one of them is that what we're dealing with when, when people are thinking about an organisation is they're dealing with a mental model of the organisation and how it does it work, its work and how it fits together. And the further you get from that mental model of, that people have of the organisation, the harder it is for people to find things because they have to fundamentally wrap their head around what feels like a completely different language and organizing principle before they can browse anything. Yeah. You know, it, it's, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, there's a, uh, one of the, you know, organizations I used to work for does some training courses and, you know, they've got an exercise in there where they sit down and they get records managers to um, think about how they, you know, okay, so you've got your function activity transaction breakdown, which function activity transaction just confuses the hell out of most people. Um, so now what we're going to do is we're going to organise all of the documents via um, based on horoscopes, and you know, and you you know, you can kind of see a scenario where you know you've got a real hippie information manager who goes, you know, it's going to be <laughs> horoscopes and fate, you know, where where the planets are in the zodiac, and as soon as people have got to do that, hopefully they start to get that this is not a mental model that you're carrying around, and so that's a that immediately hopefully gets people thinking in the right direction. But there's also a, a, a problem, and I think this is why ontologies are starting to become a real thing. You know, I was looking at basic formal ontology a little while ago, you know, and some things that they do in the medical industry. We are becoming more and more specialised. You know, bureaucracies originally were, you know, these organisations where you would have a person at the top and then you might have a small management team and they would specify all the work that needed to be done by everybody. They'd break up break the work down into tasks. The work was kind of understandable because it was really just about dealing with scale. But now what we're seeing, I mean, you look at the German public service, you know, the German public service, you have to have a master's degree now to even be able to work in it. What we're dealing with is we're dealing with organisations where people are becoming more and more and more specialised. And so, um, you know, I was looking at an ontology for um, some stuff that we've developed the other day. And it was to do with wildlife protection and it was looking at the, the the scientific names for deer and it turns out that you know the the scientific names for deer are like it's daxa and something else um you know for male and female deer and to you know to somebody who's you know a, some kind of you know biologist or something like that they're going to get that and so they've got this mental model that says oh well if i'm looking for this you know that's the term that i look for but for you and i we're just looking for deer yeah and we're absolutely. dealing with those increasing problems of increasingly specialized usage of language and so like you say you know when we're looking for climate change well you know you may be looking we, we think about it as climate change but somebody else might look at it as you know um, you know, permafrost retreating in wetlands or something like that. And I'm sure there's a specialised term for that that's used in the industry. And I think that dealing with those more and more complicated mental models, you know, the, the problem of the mental model is that if you break the mental model, people feel disorganised and they, and they don't feel like they know where they are with their work. Mm. And 
I think that's a basic underlying principle. And I realise I'm rambling on a little bit at the moment because <laughs> I've just covered a, a, a bunch <laughs> of things that I, I sort of wanted to dive into. But that problem, I think, of the primary task that creates the information, how, do the, how does the person who do that think about how they organise their work and how does that drive how they organise their content? And I think we, and we were talking about this earlier, you know, one of the challenges of thinking about all of the future usages of information is that if you break the, the way the first person, you know, has who populates the system with that information, if you break it. their yeah. mental model, then you don't get the information where you expect it because they go off somewhere else and they create something that helps them feel organised and reduces that anxiety about where am I at with my work. And I'm just going to stop talking because I've been rambling now for a couple of minutes and you guys have got a lot more to say about this than I do, I feel. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think you're absolutely right about the different mental models. I think you're absolutely right about people need to feel comfortable with where they are, as it were, in their system. So the kinds of systems where you've essentially just got a search box that you, you and you're supposed to find everything via that route just I mean I hate that because I need to to know where I am <laughs> virtually mm -hmm. in the system I need to know what's available to me what's around what can I get to what can I see what's going on that's me I mean so other people might be very happy with that but we need to understand as much as as we can about what people want and what makes them feel comfortable and ideally present to them or allow them to see things in the way that makes them comfortable as far as one can, you know, within the mm. constraints of the technology. Um, I, sorry, I'm going to keep going here for a second. You used uh, the ontology word there, Carl. Yeah. Uh -huh. And what did you mean by it? <laughs> do, do, <laughs> are, we gonna, am, am I, you, are you guys going to get me into trouble here? <laughs> um, uh oh. I, I'm 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 in a I'm in a logical arrangement of concepts showing the relationships between them, and you know we can talk okay. about that as nodes and edges, you know, and and not, um, get into knowledge graphing, or we can talk, you know, we can talk about them as entity relationship type diagrams where, you know, you've got entities and how they're related and the terms that go with them and those sorts of things. But ultimately, it's about how concepts are related to one another. That's what yeah. I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you. I think. I used the taxonomy word earlier, which is a very kind of broad brush. And I mean, the ISO standard says it's just a scheme of categories and subcategories, which kind of means, you know, anything at all, really, but doesn't necessarily imply that there are um, uh, horizontal relationships between terms, if you see what I mean. It's usually more hierarchical. Mm. Um, yeah, but, you but, end up with lots of lumping and splitting problems because yeah, you've yes. got a, you've got things that are related in some way, but you can only put them in one branch of your taxonomy, or you end up with all kinds of other problems. Yeah, so. but I I used to find in the nineties that everybody wanted a taxonomy. Yeah, before that they all wanted a thesaurus or whatever, and then in the nineties they all wanted a taxonomy, and and these days they all want an ontology, even though they don't know. What one what is, they are. <laughs> and and I've got a I've got a really great quote here from W three C, which is where have I put it now? Um, oh yeah, there's no clear division between what is referred to as vocabularies and ontologies. Now that's what they say, mm. but I think that's wow. true in terms of way people talk about these things, and I think oh. it's really sad that in a profession, i.e. information architecture, where we're all about being really clear what we mean about things, that we use these terms like vocabulary, taxonomy, ontology, as if they're all, I don't know, as if they're all the same thing, which they kind of are, but ontologies are much more formal. And as you just said, Carl, those entity relationships, so you identify what your classes are and what the properties of those classes are. So it's a very strict kind of hmm. structure sorry hmm. just wanted to get that out there no no no, no but honestly no. i think that's good because you know i mean you, you, you know why i think that's good um <laughs> i i'm on a standards panel at the moment where we're doing um we're redoing the classification guidance for um 
ISO one. It's not ISO one. It, it's the IT twenty one standards panel, and it's we're we're redoing the classification guidance for AS. You know what rolls up in what roll up into one five four eighty nine. Oh yeah, um, and it's really interesting because um, there's nowhere in that that says that you must do function activity transaction, but no. for some reason that seems to be what the entire records management um, industry has decided is the only way to do classification schemes in record systems. Why do you think that is? I don't know. I mean, it's 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 very much. I mean, uh, I'm I'm a newcomer to records management, and it seemed to me that it was Australia that led a lot of that. It's the transaction bit. I I personally feel really comfortable with function activity, but when you get down into transaction, I feel it, that's just a stu- sorry, a stupid, <laughs> um, and and a helpful, an unhelpful uh, yeah, subdivision yeah. myself. Um, why? Why? Well, yeah. what do we think of as as transactions? I mean, you'd you'd have finance and then invoicing, and then after that, I guess you'd get all the invoices, would you? As the transaction itself, or I don't know. It just it's a it's a very odd thing, and so many things don't fit that. Obviously, so I mean, in in our company, you got you've broadly got function but then you'd get down to client as being very quickly as being the fundamental entity that we care about and want to group our content around so it's yeah well i mean you're down to function activity subject that's function activity subject and you know there's there's a a huge it's i I went looking for research about the efficacy of of this way of organizing content a couple of years ago and i mean when i would say i went looking you know, I did a lot of Googling. I looked through my, my the university I was at at the time. I went looking for, you know, fat classification, fast classification, function activity, you know, through through their, yeah. um, you know, research papers. I went and I asked a whole bunch of academics about whether they, whether they had ever seen any research that showed it was effective or anything like that. What I actually found was I found a whole bunch of people arguing in papers about um, whether function activity transaction was superior to function activity subject transaction, but I'd never found any evidence that anyone had actually gone out and measured these things and right. sat down and said, "Hey, does this work in the real world?" And I mean, what I, I you know, I, I try to take a historical viewpoint on these things, and I mean, if I look at function activity transaction or function activity, you know, whatever it happens to be, if I look at the old world of records management where it was custodial, and I, I, I see. You know, you've got information coming out the end of a, a process and, you know, it starts filling up your office and then it starts filling up the hallway and before you know it, you've <laughs> got to work out on the footpath. So you've got to give that to a group of people. But that group of people have never been involved in your in your business process before and you probably don't want them to be. But there's also, because there is a point at which they take custody of that file and it gets registered, you know, so there's a registry office there, you need to be able to tell people what it's about. And function activity transaction to me makes a lot of sense when you're running records management that way. When you're taking physical custody of something, the person's a non-expert and you know what, you need to put it in a repository so that somebody can come along later and say, please give me this file of you know, function activity and about this transaction. And whatever you decide that tra- you know, the transaction unit is for your organization. You know, is it the invoice yeah, or is it the, the entire problem. business process yeah, that led to the invoice? That's really the, the problem area. I mean, I think function and maybe and, and activity, as I say, I feel comfortable with because, hey, these guys over here are doing the climate change research. So let's put the research stuff over there. They're, these guys are doing finance. Let's put that stuff over there. I mean, it's, you know, that's kind of no brainer. We don't really want to mi- mix up the HR stuff with the IT stuff or whatever it is, you know, or well, the climate change Well, except that at some point stuff. we're going to try and recruit people in IT and, you know. <laughs> well, you've... <laughs> this, is, this is where it gets hard, I reckon. Uh, I mean, there's a million ways in which it gets hard. But there's, yeah, exactly. Exactly, Michael. There's a million ways you could cut it, but what are the those kind of really high-level obvious ways where these guys are all doing this? Let's put that stuff together and then let's allow them to slice and dice it in lots of different ways within that yeah. is the ideal. The transaction thing, I really don't get. Um, in terms of what I just said about client, 
us arranging our stuff by client. The client isn't the subject because that would be just stuff kind of about the, it's more like a case file. Mm, okay. And case files make sense, don't they? We need everything yeah, to do think, with this client. So. We need yeah. everything to do with this project. We need everything to do with this legal case. So that makes mm -hmm. sense. Yeah. But I think it's, I think but what you're saying, Carl, is just, things. yeah, yeah, well, it's, it's just so, what, what's the most logical grouping? But I think, um, let's, like, I think we can definitely say some things here around uh, uh, sort of weaving it back into, you know, helping people find things is that, for example, if I have a case file system that may be really valuable for those people who are a working on a case and b um coming back to working with the same people or you know same client or same whoever because you know we can kind of get a um a full view of the information that relates to that um I was going to say transaction <laughs> but that, <laughs> no. um, that, that that case or you know that 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 chunk of work and who's involved with that chunk of work um so you can get that completeness but but typically um uh what, what's an example um uh, i'm not going to think of a good one of hand but there will be information that sits in every case file that then might serve as kind of either just a lesson or a precedent for what you do yeah, next in like some a, other case a project and initiation so then, document and i'd like to look at all the pids so that because i'm just writing one it would be really oh, nice, nice yeah. to take to look at them from the last six projects, say. Perfect. Yep. Yep. For sure. I mean, that, that's or, actually a... or um um to take that subject lens, you know, like um I've got a whole series of different cases where we were dealing with a particular subject and now I would like to see the yes. outcomes of yes. each case yes. and the outputs of each case that relate to that subject because I don't care which case and I don't know which case. So don't make me as the end user drill into every case to read the outcomes. Yeah. Let me sort of browse across or search across. Um, and so that's, uh, I think, um, that's part of that exercise of teasing out people's requirements, you know, as in what, what do you, how do you actually expect to find stuff and what do you actually need to find? Um, and I think it's also part of something that we probably haven't emphasized enough here, which is that um, in most sort of systems, you're going to put something into a kind of a, a container, but finding strategies and semantic tools and all of that need to allow for multiple ways to find things. Yeah, absolutely. Just the short, short vision. Yeah. I mean, it, it, what, what, a lot of what we're talking about deals really well with the uh, problem that I need to find, you know, like I need to find a case file. You know, I need to find this case file. Okay, great. Here is the case file. But what what you're just talking about, and I think where I, I think where everybody is looking for the gains at the moment are in how you manage stuff or how you and which you know ultimately comes down to how you see cross sectional data about things. So like you know, like you were just saying, Judy. You know, <clears throat> I may be you know I may be involved in some kind of project governance function and. Okay, it's lovely that I can find all of the project files for that we've ever done, but all I actually want is I want to see the the initiation document from each project yeah. file. So how do I make that findable? Or, you know, if I've got um, again, if I'm involved in some kind of project governance function, you know, how do I find all of the risks and issues logs that go with all of those projects so that I can start to get a sense of, you know, yeah. current projects, what our risks and issues are across all of them. And you know, not just that. You know, if that information is in a spreadsheet, well, you know, you want to go up the next level again, which is you want to see an abstraction of that, which is I want to report on every single thing that's read, you know, if you've got traffic light systems that's read in my yeah. risks and issues yeah. logs so that I yeah. can deal with it. But we, we're continually, this is one of these things about records that I, I think it's a place we're stuck. And it's why I keep advocating for, you know, like Microsoft 365, you know, lists, Power BI, you know, starting to get into more structured ways of looking at these things. And I mean, metadata is just, metadata is just data when you get right down to it. But mm. um, because where I see the big gains being made is in those higher levels of abstraction. You know, that's what organisations want. I, I think what they're saying to us is that, for, for lots of organizations, I think they're saying we have the day-to-day -day findability stuff nailed. You know, I I, I am a process really? worker. So <laughs> hear me out, hear me out. Come on, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. controversial. So let me let me let me finish that thought bubble. 
I am a process worker and I am working on a process or I am working on a case and I'm going to work on that case from start to finish. I have the findability requirements of the things that I create within that case nailed because it's just how I organise myself to get my work done. And, you know, I have a little file over here on a file server and that's how I organise myself. And if you take that out of there and you make me organise that work by the retention classes that go with it, I'm going to fight you oh. to the death and I'm, yeah, not, and yeah. I'm not going to put it anywhere near the system that you're Absolutely. asking me to put it in. So I think what people in I think what people in organisations are saying is we've got that stuff nailed. You know how we put things in somewhere we can do that ourselves. But I think what organisations are really crying out for is all of the stuff that goes above it. You know I know there's a there's a great project over here that um, one of the agencies did, um, and I have I don't know whether they're comfortable with me talking about it, but. Um, where they had ministerial correspondence. And, and actually, it's one of the case studies for one of the vendors that I've worked for in the past. But, you know, what, what they've done is that they've used workflows to create a system that lets people in those offices understand the status of all of the current pieces mm. of ministerial correspondence they've mm. got. So, sure. you know, that's a findability aspect. I want to find out the status yeah. of all of the current work that my team has so that I can take managerial actions to yeah. either escalate, to drive new actions, to do whatever I need to, so that, you know, I don't hit the 28-day, you know, Premier's directive on ministerial correspondence. And I feel like records management, I don't feel like we deal with those use cases very well. I don't think we're prepared to deal with them. And it's one of the reasons I've been such an advocate for Microsoft 365, because I see work like some of our friends are doing where, um, you know, you've got a team, they've been just used to putting their things in buckets. Now we're saying, well, this list over here is just a bucket. And, you know, if you put your stuff in that, we'll set up a workflow mm. that will track this work for you and move it through the other people in the process. And it will also populate this Power BI report here yeah. so that your yeah, manager is exactly. not going to come to you at the end of every day and say, I need yeah. you to spend an hour writing me a status report. They're just going to go to the just Power there. BI report that does it yeah. live and in real time. And that's just a question of putting the metadata on the container rather mm -hmm. than, you know, having to bother with everything in the in within the container. If you put it on the container, then you can easily, as you say, aggregate it up and report on it nicely. But people don't but you're right, people don't always think like that, or it just seems too hard, or they don't know how, or whatever. But it's it's actually not it's not that big a deal to make it happen and could can give a huge amount of insight as you say yeah but you know business yeah, business sure. intelligence and i think um uh winding back to the start where we said you know search isn't enough like like this is a perfect example of that that of my need yes, to it is. Yes. information is an aggregation yes. not an aggregation an abstraction i think is the word you use carl like yeah. if, if we need to roll up information to say, you know, how many of the things are in what status, um, then that's not that's not a search driven kind of not a scenario. All. Yeah. Well, well I mean, it could be, but you know, building that search engine is going to be horrifically expensive. <laughs> and and yeah, I think that sure. what what we're actually talking about with these sorts of search use cases is we're talking about the point at which people it's almost like the internal mental cost benefit analysis type thing. And you know, it's sort of, well, I can sit down and I can try and find every single process, you know, project initiation document and then read them all to see whether this thing came up. And then, but, you know, by the time someone's done that, they're old and grey and, and their mm. organisation's burnt down because they weren't doing their job. They were reading the project yeah, initiation yeah. documents. Empathy. And so, <laughs> so often people will just do without that information because, mm. It's too yes. hard to find. Yes, we don't. Yeah. We don't. That and we it haven't. It really that shouldn't be. It really <laughs> no. shouldn't be. Cool. So uh, I think in terms of time, we might we might have to wrap this one up. Um, <laughs> but uh, I mean, there's so much more that we could be saying. Oh, but um, but proud. certainly, um, part of establishing that case is working with the people to understand what they need, you know, in order to be able to access the information in the way that they expect to. So you know, I think we've we've covered that one off nicely. Um, we're, we're hoping that we will have a special guest coming up to talk about information culture and our current plan is that that will be next time. If not, then very soon. Um, so yeah, thanks I'm everyone for listening. Yeah, me too. Yeah, and hopefully we'll get our first guest in shortly. 
Thanks. Thank you. One and all. Fantastic. Thanks, Michael. Thank Thanks, Judy. Bye. Thanks, everyone.